Secondly, once he realizes what he's done, he's ready to commit suicide. The suicide theme, write this down, the, sui the suicide theme is ever present in our, uh, in our story of Hercules. We'll get to it at the very end of his life, okay? Theseus, however, comes to save the day. Theseus, the great hero who we were just talking about, who is related to Hercules, will come to him and he will say, it is a coward's way to commit suicide. You have done something terrible. The only way you can live with yourself is to atone. Our word here is penance, to atone. And it will be then, that will be your life. In other words, he says it this way, suffer and be strong. We think, of course, and here's a 3A observation, of the great Nietzsche line, that which does not destroy me makes me stronger. This is the same game that's being played here. Suffer and be strong, he's told. And he takes him back to Athens. Hercules goes to Delphi, to the Oracle. What can I do to atone for the fact I killed my wife, Megara, as well as my three sons? The Oracle will say, you need to go to the king of Mycenae, Eurythius, and Eurythius will give you quests that will allow you to purge your sins, killing your wife and, and sons. We, Eurythius, in fact, does do this. I mean, think about this. It would be nice to have a king, to be a king, and all of a sudden the greatest hero shows up and he says, what do you want me to do? And so, well, I'd like you to do this, and I'd like you to do this, and I'd like you to do this. For your notes, let's write this down. These are referred to in mythology as the 12 labors of Hercules. Now, I don't have time to go into all of these in detail, but we definitely want these in our notes. Um, what are the 12 labors, tasks, if you will, challenges of Hercules? Let's go through them quickly. One, I hope you're writing these down as we number them. One, first of all, you've got to kill the lion of Nemo. Lion of Nemo is incredibly large and strong, sharp teeth. Hercules will choke the lion to death. Two, you need to kill the nine-headed hydra. The problem, of course, is every time you chop off one of the heads, it grows more. So, with the help of his nephew, Aeolus, he gets a burning brand, it's pretty ingenious, and then he cuts off the head, but then he sears it closed so more heads can't grow out, and he's able to kill the nine-headed hydra. Three, it takes him a year, but he is sent to catch the stag or deer with the golden horns, which is sacred to Artemis, and he finally does it. Four, he's sent to run down this huge boar, it's dangerous and it's strong and he chases it and chases it but the way he catches it is he chases it into the snow and the boar gets stuck and they can't move and then Hercules can catch the boar. Five, the Aegean stables where horses are kept are huge thousands and thousands of ponies and they're disgusting and he's told clean out the stables which would take years to do. What Hercules does is he diverts two large rivers and it floods and it rushes through and cleans out the stables. Six, he's told that he needs to drive away the Stymphelian birds, and Athena helps him with special errors, and so he does that. Seven, he's told you need to go to Crete, and you need to fetch back, bring back the savage bull that Poseidon gave to Minos. And he does that. Of course, this bull is incredibly strong. By the way, we have bulls that, mention, that are mentioned a lot in mythology, and fighting against the bull is, for Hercules, one of those kind of tasks that he seems to like to do. Okay? Um, th the next, number eight, the next task. You've got to kill Diomenes and then drive off these man-eating mares. And so he does that. Okay? Number nine. You need to get Hippolytus' girdle. So, down to the Amazons he goes, and this is kind of a tragic story. Hippolyta wants to give him the girdle, but um, the, the women there, remember Amazons are all women, the women there think that Hercules is attacking them. They come to defend their queen. He thinks that they're being sent against them. He ends up killing the queen, killing all of the, all of the women, and bringing back the girdle. Number 10, he's told you need to bring back the cattle of Garam, this three-headed monster. And in the process of doing that, he sets up the pillars of Hercules, Gibraltar and Sir. Eleven, and this is without question the most difficult so far of his tasks or labors, you need to bring back the golden apples 
of the Hesperides. Now the problem is this. Atlas, who carries the earth on his shoulders, right? Atlas is the father of the Hesperides. So he goes to Atlas and he says, hey listen, I need the apples, these, this golden apple, okay, from your daughters. And Atlas says, boy, that's going to be rough. I tell you what, I'm willing to do that if you'll take the earth and you'll hold it on your shoulders and then I'll go and get the apple. Right? Atlas is smart enough to go, this holding the earth on my shoulders stinks. I'm going to turn the task over to Hercules. The minute Hercules does this, right, then um, Atlas goes, I'll see you in a while. And off he goes. He gets the apples, he brings it back, but then he says, you know what? I think I like not having the earth on my shoulders. Why don't you just have the earth on your shoulders forever? And Hercules goes, I will. I'll do that for you. But here's the deal. Will you let me get some kind of a padding that I can put on my shoulders and then I'm more than happy to hold this world for you. And Atlas goes, oh yeah, no, no, no worries. And so Hercules says to Atlas, I tell you what, I'm gonna give this to you for a second, I'm gonna reach down and get this padding, I'm gonna put it here on my shoulders and then I'll take the earth back from you. And Atlas goes, okay, but to do that I have to set my apple down. Yeah, set your apple down, I'll give you the earth and then I'll take it back from you when I get my padding. And of course the moment that he gives the earth back to Atlas, he picks up the apple and he says, nice knowing you and he walks off. So you can kind of see some of the eyes irony of the story here, right? Okay. Finally, the worst, number 12, the worst labor of all. I need you to go to Hades, and while you're down there, I want you to get Cerberus. Now, of course, Cerberus is the three-headed dog that guards Hades, okay? Um, <laughs> you, maybe, maybe you just wanted to see this, this the dog to see if it really existed. So down into Hades, Hercules goes, and when he goes down there, guess what? He sees Theseus sitting on the chair of forgetfulness, and he says, dude, what are you doing down here? And he takes Theseus, he rescues Theseus, right, and he gets him off the, and he gets him off the chair, he frees Theseus, and in the meantime, he also gets service, and he brings him up. The minute that Eurytha sees service, he's like, okay, 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 you need to return that back to Hades, because that's the scariest thing I ever saw. Hercules takes him back down to, to Hades. Our final stories are stories of conquest and death. Let's go through them quickly. The next conquest. Antaeus is a giant, but the problem is he has to kill this giant, but the way he has to kill this giant is he cannot let the giant hit the floor, because the minute the giant hits the floor, he gets stronger. And so what Hercules does is he picks him up and he strangles him over his head, so that way the giant can't touch the floor and gain the strength that he needs, right? Um, he uh, subdues Archelaus, who takes the form of a bull, and then he goes through a process of fighting against this bull. And out of this, actually, Achille, um, um, Hercules ends up um, getting the girl, uh, Dynenera, and Dynenera, and, and he then will wed, and he marries her. Let's finish now with a few other adventures that Hamilton will talk about. He is the great traveler. Let's put that in our notes. Hercules loves to travel, as do many, of course, of these, of these heroes. He goes to Troy, the city. He rescues a girl there. He subdues the ungrateful city. Okay. He goes to the Caucasus, and there he frees Prometheus by killing the eagle that is constantly eating at the liver of Prometheus. Okay. He's at a party. <laughs> this is bizarre. He's at a party. There's a serving boy there. The serving boy reaches across to help, and Hercules turns quickly, jacks the kid, and kills him. More examples of this kind of, you know, type of thing, right? He instantly, as well, kills a friend, right, in rage, and he's sent to Queen Omphil, where he has to serve penance, and part of the penance is he has to dress up and be humiliated like a woman. Okay. Um, he brings Alistes back from the dead in a story when he shows up at a friend's house and the friend has been told that he must die but he doesn't want to die and so he asks his wife will you die in my stead and she says I love you of course I'll die for you so she does and he is uh, uh, Alistes is actually mourning the death of his wife when Hercules shows up Alistes showing proper hospitality, this is big for the Greeks, showing hospitality, he doesn't tell him that he's mourning the death of his wife, just a servant girl who has died. But, he says, I want you to stay in my house, that evening Hercules gets stone blind drunk, 
and he starts, you know, doing disrespectful things because he's drunk. And one of the servants tells him, you know, we're all in mourning here because the queen is dead. And Hercules is embarrassed because he got drunk and he did something really stupid. And he says, I have to find a way to atone for this. And so he goes down into the underworld and he gets the queen back. And he brings the queen back to his friend, Alistes. The final story is a fascinating one. Let's put it in our notes. Dianera, his wife, is jealous. She tries to kill him with a poisoned robe, but it only makes him sick. But ultimately, he decides that he has had enough of living. He actually commits suicide by building this huge pyre, funeral pyre, on uh, Mount Otia. And there, he lays down on the funeral pyre, pyre as if he's laying down on a couch to take a nap. And he commits suicide. The, uh, there's, there's, always been a, there's always been a debate about the end of this, and in fact, I'll read the uh, final lines of this treatment because it's a beautiful lines um, that for Hamilton. Then the flames rushed up, and Hercules was seen no more on earth. He was taken to heaven. So this is a famous story about Hercules. He doesn't go to the underworld committing suicide, but rather he's taken to heaven, where he was reconciled to Hera, who of course had always had problems with him, and married her daughter Hebe, and where, after his mighty labors, he has rest, his choices prize eternal peace within the homes of blessedness. But it's not easy to imagine Hercules contently enjoying rest and peace or allowing the blessed gods to do so either. Hercules is always going to be defined by his desire for more fighting action, we might say. All right, let's finish now at level two and three on, uh, with the story. 2A, well, you come up with your own message here, the passion as well as the regret, and the idea of why he is so loved as a hero, right? He makes mistakes, but then he's very much apologetic about those mistakes, right? He feels badly, okay? At uh, 2B, well, your symbol, dude, you picked the symbol. I mean, obviously, there's, there's a lot of them, right? All of those different labors for penance. In other words, you feel badly. Okay, so you feel badly, but you've got to actually do something to show that you are worthy of the penance. And so we've got that game going on. What's the primary conflict? Well, I mean, think about it. The head, Theseus kind of represents that, versus the heart of the emotions. Hercules obviously represents that. We're going to see the same breakdown of head versus heart when we study Achilles and Odysseus later. Achilles is this guy, he just gets enraged like Hercules and he wants to jack somebody. Odysseus is a lot more like Theseus, more about thinking, thinking, using the head, right? So there's an interesting conflict there, which is better, right? Of course, if you could bring the two together in Theseus and Hercules, you would have the penultimate kind of hero, right? At 3A, relationship to other texts. Well, the Troy tale is coming in our next lecture, and we're going to see so many overtones, right? Lots and lots of movies, of course, about Hercules. Lots of video games that we'll play. What, what is for you the video game? I mean, just as I was telling you stories, what was the video game for you that immediately came to mind, right? And we mentioned, for example, the Lord of the Rings stories and some of those kind of conquests, the weapons that are important and all of that, right? I mean, it's a funny thing. I've had students that say, you yeah, know, it's funny. Most, a lot of video games, the first thing they want you to do is to pick the special weapons. What's up with the special weapons? Like, why is that such a big deal, right? Or, I'm going to go through this process of all these different um, adventures, and the weapons are somehow going to factor heavily into my success. Well, think about all the different stories that go down here with that one, right? Finally, at 3B, what is your greatest labor of penance? In other words... You did something you probably shouldn't have, and then you had to do something to make up for it. What is that one for you? Just like Hercules had to do his, right? Finally, what about his death? Does it bother you that he says it? Because I could, death wouldn't come for me, I went to death. Which begs a really interesting question for your notes. How do great heroes die? Death narratives for heroes are very important. I'm just thinking, for example, of Beowulf, the great Anglo-Saxon hero, who at the end of his life will die fighting that famous fight with the dragon and then will ask to be remembered through a lighthouse, right? Okay, our final, uh, our final story, chapter 12, is Atalanta. Atalanta is a heroine story. So we're finally going to get to a story about a woman and not a man. Hurrah! Let's, let's play that game. Atalanta's father wants a son. Again, this is a common motif wants a son. All he has is a daughter. He 
he really doesn't want a daughter, he wants a son. So he exposes her on the mountain. Now this is going to sound very familiar to you. Again, another motif that's going to sound very much like Oedipus, of course, who will be exposed as well. The idea is this. He can't kill his daughter because that's bad form and Zeus will be mad. So he does the next best thing. And he takes her out, leaves her on the mountain to die. Therefore, it's not really my fault because the daughter died out on the mountain. A bear, a sheep bear, will save her. For those of you that know anything about, for example, the Mowgli stories from Kipling's Jungle Book. For those of you that know the Tarzan stories. That is to say, in other words, the child is raised first by animals, then by hunters. right? And she grows up to be some kind of warrior. All right? She is faster than all the guys. She is stronger than all the guys. I mean, for the guys in the house, you probably remember a girl like this in third grade. You go out onto the playground, you're going to take the swing. The girl walks up and says, the swing is mine. And every guy in the class went, that's cool, it's all yours, right? Because she could jack every guy in the third grade class. That is Atalanta. She is B-A-D, bad. And she kind of likes to show that she is a woman who is strong and can beat guys, all right? For example, when she's quite young, she kills two centaurs. When the centaurs show up, all the guys run. She doesn't run away. She runs towards the centaurs. You know what I'm saying? In other words, she is from the very beginning in her young age, just like Hercules was. She is going to be famous. We have the famous hunt of the Caledonian bear. This is a fun story um, that Edith Hamilton will tell. And I'll, I'll just read a few lines of this one as well for you, okay? Um, it, it works out something like this. Um, the, uh, the terrible creature sent to ravage the land to punish King Oenus because he forgot um, when he was sacrificing the first fruits to the god at harvest time. The brute devastated the land, destroyed the cattle, killed the men who tried to kill it. Finally, Oenus called for help upon the bravest men of Greece, and a splendid band of young heroes assembled, many of whom sailed later on the Argo. With them came, as a matter of course, at Atlanta, the pride of the woods of Arcady. We have a description of how she looked when she walked in on that masculine gathering. Now, for those of you who love these Hunger Games uh, books and movies, think about the origination of where that girl heroine in those stories comes from. Watch this description of her. We have a description of how she looked. A shining buckle clasped her robe at the neck. Her hair was simply dressed, caught up in a knot behind. An ivory quiver hung upon her left shoulder and in her hand was a bow. Put it in your notes. Atalanta is defined by how she can shoot a bow, right? She's, she's much better at it than any guy. Thus, she was attired. As for her face, it seemed too maidenly to be that of a boy and too boyish to be that of a maiden. To one man there, however, she looked lovelier and more desirable than any maiden he'd ever seen. Onus's son, Maligar, fell in love with her at first sight, but we may, assume, uh, we may be sure Atalanta treated him as a good comrade, not as a possible lover. She had no liking for men except his companions in the hunt, and she was determined never to marry. Well, we got all kinds of interesting um, stories here. The most interesting one is that together, they go off and hunt this boar who kills actually two guys and another guy ends up getting killed uh, by a friendly fire and a javelin but ends up with at Atlanta um, shooting the boar and wounding the boar and then uh, Malek, our, uh, the, the man, kills the boar and so it comes down to who's responsible for the death of the boar. He is going to take credit but ultimately has to admit I couldn't have done it without the arrow shot of at Atlanta and so he ultimately will he ultimately will do that it's it's interesting um, because we have a little a story here that the mother of Melagar um, had been told in his youth that there was a special log on the fire and the minute that it burned down he would die so she snatched the log out of the fire and kept it in her robe but when she found out that her son was outdone by a girl she burns the she burns the log up in disgust, and Malachar dies. Um, and then she goes on to commit suicide herself because she realizes that she's done something shameful, right? But just for your notes, I want to put this in your notes. There is this tension between guys and girls. In other words, guys have a tendency to be afraid of a strong woman who can do something they can't do. We'll, in fact, get to the end of this story here in a second, right? 
Um, one other adventure, she, uh, Atalanta, conquers Peleus, who just ends up being Achilles' father. Um, finally, ultimately, she does find her father and she's reunited. And interestingly, because she's beautiful and she's the son of, uh, of, of a great man, she has lots of suitors, guys that want to be with her, right? And she says it. She says, I will never marry any man who can't run as fast as me. So whoever shows up, I mean, think about this, guys, if this was the way you have to get a prom date. So in other words, she says it this way, the only man I'll marry is a man who can outrun me. The only problem is she can outrun all the guys. So for example, she will get ready to run against them, and off she goes, and the guy can't keep up because she can outrun him because she can run faster and longer, right? Well, there is a young man. <clears throat> His name goes by two different names for your notes, Millennium or Hippomenes, and Hippomenes, or Millennium, says, this is the girl for me. I'm not as fast as her, but I got a plan. He goes out and he gets three golden apples. We're back to golden apples again. I told you it's a motif we're going to see over and over again. And he says, this is what I'm going to do. These apples, they're, 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 going, to, they're going to draw our attention. So what he does is he has this race with her. And when he's starting to get tired, he takes the first apple and he throws it out in front of her. And she slows down and picks up the apple. And it allows him to catch up a little closer. The second apple gets thrown. Finally, the third apple gets thrown, and the third apple doesn't. She finally reaches down, and as she reaches down to pick up the apple, he touches her and says, I caught you, and ultimately, he ends up then being allowed to marry. They do marry. There is a story that actually, because they get in trouble with Zeus, they get turned into lions. Ultimately, though, they do have a son, Parthamina Papas, and uh, this is one of the seven... Um, um, agents against uh, that's uh, one of the seven against Thebes that we'll talk about in a, in a later lecture. Well, it's finished really quickly at 2A, this story. Well, one obvious answer is why is it men are often jealous of strong women, and why is it even some women are, are jealous of strong women?